Good morning and welcome to Southside Online. My name is Chris and I'm joining you live from our Noonan location. So I know you're watching at home or maybe you're at the beach, wherever you might be. We would love to see you back at one of our Southside locations. Well, why am I wearing this today? Well, a couple of reasons. One is we're having mega awesome costume party for our kids as well as trick or transit for our middle school students. So you're gonna see some pretty crazy outfits behind me. It's so much fun to be here. Uh, but the second reason I'm wearing this is because our beloved Braves can you believe it, are in the World Series. It is so close right now. Um, so what we're gonna do is spend the rest of our time in service praying for the Braves. Does that sound good? I'm just kidding. No, how cool is it that the Braves are back? And speaking of the Braves, I had a chance to catch up with an old friend and Southside attender who's a Braves Hall of Famer. So check this out. Hey, Southside family, here with our friend, Tim Hudson, who used to be, he and his family, here at Southside and uh, is joining us for a little bit. And uh, so great to see you, Tim. How y'all doing? Hey, Southside, how you doing? You know, we are making it week after week. It's getting better and better through COVID, you know, but um, for those of you, uh, Braves fans are super familiar with Tim, but Tim played for 17 seasons with not only the Braves, but also Oakland A's and with the San Francisco Giants as well. And four-time All-Star uh, in 2000 was the American League leader in wins. And then in uh, 2010 was the National League Comeback Player of the Year, uh, also in the Braves Hall of Fame. But I know that um, Kim would say he's one of the most amazing husbands. He's got three kids uh, in school and as a great father, and I can attest to that. Um, but also was one of our, on our guest services teams, a greeter, used to pass out bulletins to folks walking in and they didn't always recognize you, right? Yeah, I didn't look like much of an athlete back then, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think people didn't recognize you without your hat on, was the deal. So, But uh, Tim, here's the question I've always wanted to ask you is, so I'm a big uh, fan of Moneyball, the, the movie. If you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. I've seen it over 20 times. What was it like working with Brad Pitt? Uh, it, you know, it was pretty, it had to give him a few pointers here and there, you know, as it was a, uh, you know, his acting skills were a little shabby at, at, at times, but uh, he, you know, it, it was a great movie. It was great to see a part of your life kind of played out on the big screen. It, it was pretty awesome. Uh, exactly. That was really cool. I get confused by people with, as, as being him sometimes. It's weird, but um, no, I love that movie. I love the, the characters in it and just, yeah, that portraying that season was, was amazing, but um you know, we just had a pitcher go down, Charlie Morton. So we still have your jersey hanging upstairs and upstreet, and we can we can grab that if you want. If you don't mind coming up for a couple of games and helping us out, is would you be willing? You know what? If they wanted me to come and throw a bat in practice to our guys to get them locked in for Houston's pitching, that'd probably be a little more up my speed this this time of, of my career. Um, but it's uh, gotcha. yeah, it's you know, it's some tough luck right there for the Braves. But I think they have some some guys to be able to step in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you've won a World Series with the Giants and, and you've been in these situations before. And, you know, what would you say is going to be the keys for us to win? Well, you know, obviously, you know, dominating the routine play, uh, you know, great pitching and good defense is always going to win ball games. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, our leadership, I think, you know, having Brian Snicker, you know, calling the shots and, and, and making sure these boys are ready. I think he gets the best out of his players and they love playing for him. So, you know, that's uh, it's what it boils down to is, is, is those those three aspects for sure. That's awesome. Well, we, we hope uh, that the Braves will, will win this series and uh, we're, we're a little bit overdue, I think. And so, uh, but thanks so much for joining us. It was great to see Kim as well and tell the kids hello. And uh, we miss you guys. We miss you guys too. And uh, to my Southside family, go Braves and War Eagle. There we go. All right, thanks, Tim. See, see you later. later. That was so much fun. And you know what? We're just getting started. I love being here in person, but I know you're there watching online and we would love to see you back at some point in time, but we've got a phenomenal service plan. So get ready to sing and enjoy an inspiring message. And I'll see you in a bit. Hallelujah. 
can hear the wind blowing, blowing, blowing. Move upon our praise, sons and daughters sing. We can hear the wind blowing, blowing. Sundays like today are special for us for so many reasons. We love to see children and students excited to invite their friends to church. This is an important part of seeing the faith of the next generation grow. But we understand it can be hard to invite someone to church. We want to make it as easy to invite your friends, family, coworkers, and their families, not just on special Sundays like today, but every Sunday. And your generosity helps us create irresistible experiences to invite your friends who don't attend church. If you've ever joined us in giving, thank you so much. A couple of weeks ago, Andy identified 1.0 giving as giving spontaneously to help immediately. In other words, you see an immediate need and give in that moment to meet that need. But today, I'm asking you to take it a step further to become what we call a 2.0 giver. Someone like you who gives a percentage of your income consistently and automates your giving to your church, Southside, where you engage, are involved in different ways, and that is impacting lives each and every day. When you plan ahead, it allows us to be the church that you know and love. You see, I'm here at our Noonan campus today where hundreds of children, students, and adults are gathering. But you know what else? It will also be someone's very first time to come to church, or maybe they haven't come in years. Why are they here? Well, someone invited them, and they have a need that only God can meet. And when you give a percentage each month, it helps us create irresistible children and student environments where young people hear about a God that wants to know them, a God who loves them. It allows us to facilitate small groups where questions about God can become a conversation about faith. So if you call Southside your church, and haven't made a plan to give, I would like to invite you to join us in this mission. It's because of generosity of people just like you that this church is here. And so the easiest way to give to Southside is to download our app, if you haven't already, and just click the little star at the bottom that says give. Now, we're about to hear from our teaching pastor, Andy Stanley, with part two of Reassembly Required. But before we do, I'd like to take a moment and pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much 
We get to celebrate today who you are. And that as we see these kids and students in costumes, that it's more than that. It's more than just showing up to a building. It's building relationships, helping the next generation have a faith of their own. God, speak to us now through this message. Give us the courage to take a step. And God, for those of us that need to take a step in giving, I pray, God, that you would show up in your, our lives, that you would show off your faithfulness as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So um, as you know, uh, most things that require assembly, whether it's toys or um, furniture or a grill, I actually uh, assembled a grill one time because I wanted to save $50. And by the time it was over, Sandra would have paid someone $250 to come assemble that grill because it was, it was so stressful. But anyway, anytime you purchase something that um, requires assembly, it comes with assembly instructions, but they don't, things don't come with fix it instructions. What things come with now, and, and you've seen this over and over, people, they, they send us a troubleshooting guide, which I don't know about for you, but for me, this is generally a complete waste of time because the trouble that they're shooting is never the trouble that I'm actually having, right? But they, I think it just makes us feel better. Like, well, maybe you'll be able to fix this. But generally, it's just difficult to fix things, even though we know how to put things together. Um, and I think intuitively, we're all better at assembling things than fixing things. And to the point of our time today, that certainly includes our relationships. We're good at starting relationships. Um, we're generally good at enjoying relationships, but we're not all that good oftentimes at fixing relationships. But here's what we all do. We all try to fix relationships. So last week, um, we looked at sort of the traditional, typical, I would say sort of intuitive approach to repairing a broken relationship. Um, I call it the C4, the C4 approach to relationship management, which includes these four handy tools, convince, convict, coerce, and control. Convince, convict, coerce, and control. These are often just intuitively the tools that we reach for first. And the reason we reach for these tools first is because we're crazy. Um, and I say that because none of those things work on us, right? And yet we think somehow they're gonna work on other people, but they don't work on anybody, but we continue to work them or try to work them. Um, I think I told you last time that the, the handle that I go for first, the tool I go for first is the convince tool. When there's um, a relational conflict, you know, currently, or when I even consider, you know, I think about somebody I need to reconnect with or patch things up with, my, my initial response is, if I can just get that person to sit down with me and I just give them more information, they're gonna go, oh, well, yeah, I I, of course I was wrong. I just needed more information and that never works. In fact, my, I would say my greatest regret in life actually um, relates to this. Um, I was responsible for taking care of my mom for the last 10 to 12 years of her life. And I was, you know, I was so happy to be responsible for my mom and love my mom, but my mom, my mom could be stubborn. In fact, my dad used to tell me when I was growing up, your mom is so stubborn. I'm like, my, mom, my mom's not stubborn. Then when I was responsible for my mom, I discovered she could be stubborn and she wasn't necessarily wrong. It's just that once she made up her mind, her mind was made up and it didn't matter how much information I gave her. Now, Tony Dungy, this is interesting. Tony Dungy says that stubbornness is a virtue when you're right. And I think that was my mom's philosophy of life. It's okay to be stubborn because I'm right. But in my, you know, my relationship with her, I'm trying to take care of her. It was medical stuff. It was you know, all kinds of stuff and I'm responsible and I love my mom. And when she wouldn't cooperate with what I was convinced she would do, what would I do? I would just try to convince her. So this whole, this whole thing comes to a, you know, a head and, and you know, suddenly my eyes were open. One afternoon I'm at her house. I don't even remember what the issue was. Um, and I'm sitting there, I'm sitting in the living room with her and our chairs are kind of sitting like this, you know, so she's sort of beside me. And I'm, I'm just going on and on and on about, mom, please, you know, you got to, you have to, you know, this is the right thing to do. And she was just quiet, which meant I could talk all day. She wasn't gonna change her mind. And she reaches over, I'll never forget, she leaned toward me and she put her hand on my wrist. I remember she put her hand on my wrist and she said, Andy, I just need you 
to love me. I know it's like, pssst, you know, all, all, the, all the energy and all the frustration, all the anger. Andy, I just need you to love me. And essentially what is she saying is, look, look, I, I, I know, I know you, you know, you're trying to do the right thing and you're convinced, but that's, that's not what I need. And you know what? That's not what anybody needs. And, but these are the tools. And maybe you have a favorite or you have a go-to, maybe it's convict. Um, this is the, the shame game and the blame game. This is the, after all I've done for you, you know, after all the opportunities I gave you in this organization, after all the money I loaned to you, after, you know, after I stuck with you through thick and thin, after all I've done for you. And again, you know, coerced, control, nobody wants to be coerced or controlled, but we just go there because somehow, I think it's just intuitive, but when we stop and think about it, or when you look at the list, you know, this doesn't work on you. This doesn't actually work on anybody. In fact, do you know what all four of these have in common? Do you know, what, let me put it this way. Do you know what all four of these feel like when you're on the receiving end? When you're on the other side of any of these four things, do you know what it feels like? It feels like this. It feels like rejection. It just feels like rejection. It just feels like somebody's just pushing you away. And do you know what's kryptonite to our relationship? Rejection. It's kryptonite because in fact, rejection is kryptonite even when you're right. And here's what I mean by that. Even when I'm trying to you know, convince my mom and I'm absolutely right, or even when somebody's trying to coerce you to do something that's actually good for you, or when somebody's you know, controlling, but at the end of the day, you, know, you need to be a little bit you know, controlled, even, even when they're right, even when you're right, it's still kryptonite to the relationship because rejection undermines relationships. Rejection closes hearts. Um, it makes us less accessible. It makes the other person less accessible, it undermines our influence with people, it undermines people's influence with us. And do you know what everybody really wants? Everybody wants agenda free. Everybody wants you like me for me. Everybody wants to be accepted. And that's why the whole repairing a broken relationship thing is so baffling because we all know that. Nobody's gonna write that down. Yeah, that's what I want. I want acceptance. I don't want rejection. I, you know, you put that on the mirror. I don't, we just know this. But for some reason, when it comes to relationships in general, but specifically when it comes to repairing a broken relationship, somehow we forget all of this. And so it doesn't seem like it should be that hard, but it is hard. It's hard, number one, because we're crazy. I've already covered that. But actually the real reason it's hard is because reassembly or reassembling a broken relationship is actually a skill. It's actually something you have to learn to do. And all of us come into this world unlearned and many of us ne never see it done well in our families. We've never even seen it modeled for us. So today we are in fact in part two of our series, Reassembly Required, a beginner's guide. And it's just the beginner's guide. There's way more to say about this than we'll say in this series, a beginner's guide to repairing broken relationships. Now, the good thing about uh, you know, us and the thing that we have going for us is that for the most part, all of you, all of us, most people in the world want to be reconciled or want the relationships to be fixed or reassembled. I mean, we, we don't like the tension. We don't like living with the guilt. We don't like pretending. Um, we hear ourselves telling our sad story and people are shaking their heads about, yeah, you should be angry and you should, you know, you should be the way you are and you should be distanced from them. And then we walk away and sometimes we just feel kind of sick on the inside. Like, what is that in me that just can't let this go? And one of the reasons that we're, there's, you know, there's a, a tension that never quite goes away, no matter how justified maybe we feel like we are, is that we're only as happy. And again, this is something we don't normally put words around, but this is, this is all of our experience. We are only as happy as our core relationships are healthy. This is sort of the happiness factor. We're never, we're generally speaking, we are never any happier than our core relationships, the most important relationships to us are healthy. Or we're, you could put it this way, we're only as content, we're only as content as our core relationships are mutually satisfying. And you know this personally, or you know this from your family history that broken relationships Broken relationships, they take a toll on us, right? Broken relationships, especially core relationships, take a toll on our mental, um, our emotional, and at times even our physical health. In other words, sir, your problems stem from your healthy relationships with your parents and siblings, said no counselor ever, right? I mean, this is never the root of a problem. This is the root of emotional and often physical um, and psychological health. So, 
When we started the series last time, um, we set some expectations and it's super important to reset those expectations before we dive into this first decision that we have to make. And um, this is especially important when it comes to reassembling or repairing or fixing relationships with another adult. And we said this, we said the goal of reassembly, the goal is actually not reconciliation. The goal is not reconciliation, which sounds strange because that's what the whole series is about. The goal, our personal goal is actually no regret. And if you were here last time, you'll remember the reason we can't say the goal is reconciliation is you should never set a goal for another adult. You can have a dream or a hope or a wish for another adult, but you don't set goals for other adults because goals are an agenda. And when it comes to reassembling or fixing a broken plate, or a broken anything we've purchased, we have access to all the pieces. We have control of the process. But when it comes to reassembling or fixing a relationship with another person, we don't have access to all the parts. So our goal isn't reconciliation. Our hope and our prayer is reconciliation. But the goal, the parts we have control over, And this is why the four C's don't work. The four C's assume you have and I have control over all the parts and we get so frustrated when it doesn't work, but it's because we're not fixing a plate. We're not fixing a bicycle. We're trying to fix a relationship with another individual person. So the goal has to be no regrets. The goal is to know, you know what? I did everything in my power. I I did everything I, I could do to keep the door open to put the welcome mat out, to make sure that emotionally my drawbridge is down, to make sure that I removed every obstacle I could possibly remove, that I've done everything I can do to take the pressure off the other person. And again, we know from experience that those four C's, they always make that worse. So the temptation is to do this, to say, you know what? Well, if if convincing is my handle, if convincing is my go-to, then you know what? I'm not going to try, I'm gonna try not to be so convincing. And if I find that I'm sort of coercive and then I'm manipulative, you know what? I'm gonna try not to be so coercive and manipulative. So the temptation is to say, well, you know what? I'm gonna decide not to do those four things. But, and again, this is why this is so tricky. Those are not decisions. I'm not saying they're not decisions, they're decisions, but those are not decisions. I'm deciding not to be so controlling. I'm I'm deciding not to be so coercive. I'm trying, I'm deciding not to do something. But a decision, and this is true in every area of life, a decision not to do something is not enough to get something done. And so to reassemble a broken relationship requires some decisions, but it requires more than deciding what I'm not going to do. It requires at least, I think, four proactive decisions. And these decisions don't guarantee reconciliation, right? Because we don't have control over all the pieces, but they pave the way potentially toward reconciliation. I'm gonna give you one today. And um, if you're not a Christian, not a Jesus follower, um, I I think you're gonna find this helpful. And um, I would suggest you at least embrace some of these ideas because it will certainly make your, your life better. But... For those of us who claim to be Christians, for those of us who attempt every day to get up and follow Jesus, um, this is required because Jesus marching orders for us is to do for others what God through Christ has done for us in all things, including our relationships. As we looked at last week, the apostle Paul just puts it right out there when he wrote these words. He said, in your relationships, like all your relationships, In your relationships with one another, and this is is such a high bar, isn't it? I want you to have the same mindset or the same perspective or the same attitude. I want you to embrace the same approach to relationships as Christ Jesus, your Lord. And regardless of how faithful you are or how much faith you have, if you decide or if we decide when I decide to take this seriously, the temptation is to kind of tap the breaks. Because if you know anything about Jesus and the gospels, and if you know anything about the journey of Jesus through the gospels, you recognize pretty quickly that Jesus was actually the offended party. And yet he made the first move to reconcile with us. And he didn't humble himself and invite us to coffee. You know, He humbled himself, Paul said, by taking the form of a servant, by becoming one of us and laying down his life to pay for our sins. Because from his perspective, the big obstacle between in terms of reconciling with us and mankind and with the world, the big obstacle was sin. 
And it was an obstacle we couldn't do anything about. And God was so committed to reconciling with you and reconnecting with you that God made the first move through his son to remove the obstacle of sin, not just because, just so he could forgive us, but so he could reconcile with us. Which means, and again, this is where we kind of tap the brakes. It's like, hey, I'm not, I'm not really sure I'm ready for this because, hey, Andy, if you heard my story, if people heard my story, you'd, you'd understand why I'm not so sure I can go there. And, you know, you do what I do long enough or do what a lot of you do long enough and you hear those stories, you appreciate those stories, the heartbreaking stories. But adopting the same mindset as Christ Jesus requires us to accept that reassembly always begins with us regardless of who initiated the fuss. That reassembly, that repair, that fixing the relationship, it has to begin with us, regardless of how much of it's our fault or not our fault, regardless of who initiated it or started it. And this is why we tend, even as Christians, to cross our arms and say, you know what, I forgave her, but now I'm waiting on her. I forgave him and now I'm waiting on him. I'm a Christian, I, I have forgiven but if you follow Jesus and if we follow Jesus and if we decide to embrace Jesus' mindset for our relationships, the whole idea of forgiving and crossing our arms and waiting, we lose that option. And again, it's when we wanna say, wait, but you need to hear my story. And I, I, I think I should get permission to cross my arms and wait. But here's something to think about. We're not gonna go deep into this, but just something to think about if that's your posture. Did, did you know did you know that waiting on them is a subtle way of getting back at them? Which means we might be more like them than we wanna be. And that brings us to um, our first big decision, first of four decisions that paved the way to reconciliation. Um, and the first, um, the first decision is, um, well, before I show it to you, I. I think that when you see this, you may be tempted to say, well, I've already, I've already decided that, I've already made that decision. I've, I've already settled that. And maybe that's the case, but I think in the next few minutes, you may discover it's not as settled as maybe you thought it was. And you, if you don't settle this, if we don't settle this up front, we will either intentionally, and I think most, in most cases, or unintentionally find a way to actually undermine or sabotage the reassembly process. So here's the first big decision we need to make. I will get back to, not get back at. I'm deciding up front, no matter what's happened, no matter what happens from this point forward, I'm making up my mind. I'm going to do everything I can to get back to, but I will not get back at. This is what it looks like to look like your father in heaven. Now we're gonna look at a few verses from um, Romans chapter 12. Romans, as you probably know, is a letter written to um, Christians living in Nero's Rome. And the apostle Paul spends a pretty big part of this or a significant part of this letter talking about relationships. And if you read all of this in context, clearly he was talking to people who were having a struggle in their relationships with people that were close to them, some one another's, perhaps even some people in the church. And he's trying to help them understand, okay, if you're gonna approach your relationships like Christ, if you're gonna have the mind of Christ when it comes to relationships, here's what it looks like. And as you read these, these words, I mean, there's, there's, it puts so much pressure on us. I mean, again, it's a really high mountain to climb. And if I'm just comparing myself to other people and how other people manage, you know, broken relationships or difficult relationships, you know, it's tempting to give myself a pass. And then again, I stand back as a Christian and I look at what God through Christ did for me. And like you, like all of us, we just lose all of our excuses. So here's what he says. And we're jumping in the middle and then he is coming in hot. Here's what he says. He says, love must be sincere. And we're gonna read a few verses that kind of end with the, the big takeaway in terms of this first decision, but we're kind of warming up, Paul's warming us up. Love must be sincere, which means no faking. It must be genuine. No painted on smiles, no pretending. In other words, if there is a person in your life, family, friend, you know, someone you work with, and you're pretending, you're painting on the smile, you're acting like everything's fine, Paul says, you probably have some work to do, to which we're like, yeah, but you need to hear my story, Paul's. No, I don't wanna hear your story. You have some work to do. Love must be sincere. The fact that he thinks he can tell us this without knowing our story means there might be something he knows that we don't know. In other words, and we'll, we're gonna end here in just a few minutes with this big idea. 
But to kind of give you a heads up, to tease this out, the goal is to get to the place. The goal is to get to the place where I am able to see that other person or those other persons, the way my heavenly father sees that person are those other persons. Because until I do, because they've taken something from me, they've offended me, they've hurt somebody I love, it's almost impossible to love them sincerely. Then he introduces another big you know, relational principle. We could spend a lot of time on this as well. He says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. This is his way of saying, you need to reallocate your hate. It's okay to hate, but you can hate a something without hating a person. He says, what if you did this? That person that you, you know, and we don't use the word hate because that makes us look small and petty, right? So we don't hate anybody, but he, you know, we hate them, right? So he says, if you, if you would just think about the person that you, you hate them. He says, what if you decided, I'm going to reallocate my hate. I'm gonna decide, I'm gonna hate what happened but I'm not gonna hate the person. I'm gonna hate what's happened to us, but I'm not gonna hate the person. I'm gonna hate the consequence of what, the, the, you know, the fallout of what happened to us relationally, but I am not going to hate that person. What if we decided I'm gonna hate a what, but I am not going to hate a who? The apostle Paul would say, now you're starting to remove obstacles. Now you're leaning in. Now you're making your way forward relationally. And now once you do that, it will be easier for you to see and to cling to what is good. And he goes on, he says, I want you to be devoted to one another in love. And I want you to honor one another above yourselves. And this phrase, honor one another above yourselves in our home growing up with raising kids, this was the thing, honor one another. This was our rule. This was kind of the rule above all the rules. We're just going to honor one another. And to honor another person is to defer to them. To honor another person is to say, no, you first. Your issue first, your question first, your observation first, you first. And if I decide, again, he's, he's saying, these are the things you have control over. You can't control what they do or how they respond and you can't reverse the past, but here's what you can do. And if you choose, these are all choices, right? If you choose to honor the other person, when you honor the other person, you put the other person ahead of your pride and I put the other person ahead of my ego. They come first, my pride and my ego come second. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time trying to convince you anymore. I'm gonna spend some time trying to understand you better. You defer, you first, you first, you first. Then verse 14, skipping a couple of verses. Again, this is all so hard. And because of first century language, this is one we skim over. It's like, I don't even know what that means. Bless those who persecute you. Now, chances are there's, you can't think of someone that you would use this word with, right? They're persecuting me. Now, when you're 14, 12, 13, 14, 15, living at home, yes. But you know, once you become an adult, you, it's hard to imagine somebody who they, they wake up and every time they see you, they are looking for a way to undermine your credibility, looking for a way to steal your ideas, looking for a way to make you look bad. And the apostle Paul says, here's how proactive I want you to be. I want you to bless those to persecute you. And here's what this word means. I want you to commend them. I, I don't want you to talk about them the way that they talk about you. Jesus said it this way. He said, I want you to bless those who curse you. Okay, this makes no sense. In fact, this doesn't even seem wise. This doesn't even, it certainly doesn't seem helpful. It just seems like the mount, that mountain is so high that that is such a, a huge thing to ask anybody to do. Why is he doing this? Because Paul would say, because you're Jesus follower. And this is in some ways an expression of what your heavenly father did for you. And I want you to embrace the same mindset, the same perspective on relationships that your savior has that ultimately benefited you. And again, you, you read this. I mean, I, I'm the same way. You feel like, wait, and you may be thinking, Andy, I feel like you're putting all the responsibility on me, <laughs> to which I would say, actually, technically, Paul is putting all the responsibility on all of us. And where does he get the nerve to do that? Again, he doesn't even know us. He did not even know the people he wrote this letter to. The best that we know, Paul had never been to Rome. 
He had never been to Rome and he has the audacity to write a letter to Christians in Rome he's never met, doesn't know anything about their circumstances and says, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus relationally. The implication being, I know you got a sad story and I know that you are literally in Rome, literally being persecuted. But in spite of that, this is how I want you to live. This is how I want you to relate. This is how I want you to respond. This is how I don't want you to react. Then he says this, he says, I want you to rejoice with those who rejoice. And I want you to mourn with those who mourn. Yeah, 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 but what if I don't like them? He says, well, then your light will shine even brighter. And what if, what if you know, the fact that they're sad, okay, this is icky, okay, this is awful, this isn't all of us. What if the fact that they're sad and they're mourning, what if that makes me happy? What if I actually feel like their mourning is a win for me? Then the apostle Paul would say, well, then you have work to do. Because if you find yourself internally celebrating someone's failure, if you find yourself internally celebrating someone's loss, you have work to do. He says, I want you to refuse to celebrate their losses. And again, this is almost impossible to do when someone has hurt you or betrayed you or hurt one of your kids or betrayed somebody that you love. And that tension, and see here, here's why this is important. That tension is something we have access to. And that tension is something we can go to work on. And that tension is where God wants to go to work and all of us. He's almost done. He says, I want you to live in harmony with one another. And I don't want you to be proud because proud proud ignites and fuels all four of the C's. Because all four of the C's are an attempt to prove that I'm right and you're wrong. And if you would just see the world the way I see it and do what I think you ought to do, then the world would be a better place and our relationship would be healed. He says, no, pride's always gonna get in the way. And then the payoff. Now he brings us to the statement that takes us and introduces and sort of teases out the first of our four decisions. He says this, and do not, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay anyone. Again, you wanna say, but you don't know my story. Paul's like, I've never even met any of you. Here, send this to all the Christians in Rome. You know, hey, Paul, how can you be so personal? He's going, because this isn't about me. This isn't about what's happened to them. This is about are we following Jesus? And the word repay is powerful, do not repay, because the reason we want to pay people back is because of what they've done to us. And repay, it feels like this is how I get even. And of course, as we talked about before, we're trying to get even with someone we don't even like, but intuitively we want to pay them back. And again, if someone heard your story that you would perhaps be justified in trying to pay them back, it's human nature. It is human nature to want to get back at. And it's this part of our nature that the apostle Paul, it's this part of our nature that the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us is trying to tap down, to reconfigure, to redirect so that internally we're more like our, more like our savior, that internally we're more in line with what our heavenly father wants us to do so that externally we're actually following Jesus. It, it's human nature to want to get back at, but it is the will of God for all of us to get back to, because that's what your heavenly father did for you. So decision number one, reassembling these broken relationships, I will get back to, not back at. And the powerful thing, and again, when you see this, you think, well, I've already done that. Here, here's why this is important. The powerful thing about this decision is that if you will make it intentionally, I'm not just not gonna get back at, I'm gonna actually look for a way to get back to. If you will be intentional about this relationship, it, this, this decision, it will ensure that you don't go halfway. And do you know what halfway is to reconciliation? Halfway to reconciliation is I forgave her. I forgave him. I forgave and now I'm gonna wait. I forgave and now I'm gonna wait in the apostle Paul. And I think if you think about it, this becomes clear. Forgiving and waiting, that's still back at, not back to. Because God 
Your heavenly father did not stop with forgiveness. We talked about this last time. God's forgiveness was a means to an end. And reconciliation, repairing a relationship with you and with me and with the world, that was the end. And so our heavenly father moved and made the first move in our direction, not to get back at us. This is what we sing and celebrate, right? But to get back to us. And so this is what following Jesus, this is what love requires of me. And this is what love requires of you. Again, you can forgive from a distance, but you cannot reconcile from there. You can forgive arm's length, but you can't reconcile from there. So would you decide, I will get back to, not get back at. Now, if someone has come to mind or maybe a group of people have come to mind and you in your heart, you know, you're like, your arms are crossed. You know, I'm gonna deal with my emotions and I'm gonna figure out eventually how to forgive them, but I don't know about moving forward. If, you're, if you are tempted, and we're all tempted to forgive and to wait, I wanna leave you or suggest today a prayer that you pray, a specific prayer. Um, and if you, don't, <laughs> if you don't think God answers prayer, you pray this prayer, God will answer this prayer. This will convince you that God answers prayer. But if there's something in you, when I show you this prayer that pushes back, I want you to pay attention to that. And I want you to pay specific attention to what is it in you that pushes back on praying this prayer? Because that's where you have some work to do. And chances are that's where God wants to go to work on you. Because this is a big idea. Perhaps, just perhaps, I don't know your situation, but perhaps you haven't forgiven as thoroughly as you think you have. Perhaps you haven't forgiven through all the different layers that need to be addressed in your forgiveness in light of what has done, been done to you or to perhaps to somebody that you love. Which means if there is still forgiveness issues, that person or those people, they still have control over you. So here's the prayer. And let me, before I share it to you, let me tell you one other quick story about this prayer. I, the, this this um, became a prayer, I began to pray because of something specific. Last time I told you about being in counseling with my dad and a counselor and trying to figure out our relationship. And during that time, I was so angry at a whole bunch of people, all connected to this same scenario. So I'm talking to my counselor, Steve, one day, just the two of us. And I said, Steve, I feel like I'm kind of going around in circles. I want to get this right. And I want to get out of this kind of doom, you know, this gloom and doom cycle that I'm in with these people. And he, I said, how will I know that I'm making any progress? And he gave me the greatest answer. And, and again, it was a terrifying answer. And again, the mountain just seemed to get higher. He said, here's how you'll know you're making progress. When you can see that person, when you can see those people the same way your heavenly father sees them, and when you can feel toward them what your heavenly father feels toward them, you'll know you're making progress. I thought, wow. So I went home and I began to pray to that end. And this was the prayer or the, a version of the prayer that I began praying back then. And that from time to time, I find myself praying once again. And here's, here's the prayer. Heavenly father, I just, this is just my version. Heavenly Father, help me to see. And then you put their name in there or maybe you need several blanks, right? Help me to see him, her, the way you do. I, I wanna, I, when, I, when they come to mind, I want to see them and visualize them the way you see them, not the way I see them because I see them through the filter of what they've done to me. And Heavenly Father, help me to feel toward whoever you've got your arms crossed to. Help me to feel toward them what you feel. Now here's why this is so powerful. And this is what Steve said to me when I was talking to him. He said, Andy, do you think your heavenly father is angry with him? Do you think your heavenly father is angry with her? And I said, no, I don't, I, I am, but I don't think God's mad at them because I was smart enough to know what most of us know. Sin, sin breaks God's heart because sin breaks people and sin breaks relationships. So I realized there's the disconnect. I'm angry with them. My heavenly father is not angry with them. My heavenly father is angry over what's happened to us. 
So I haven't reallocated my hate and my anger. So I have work to do. So I began to pray this prayer, God, I'm not there yet. I want to, when they come to mind, I wanna see them the way you see them. You're not angry with them. You're brokenhearted over the sin that they've committed that I think they've committed. You're brokenhearted over the sin I've committed that they think I've committed. You're, you're brokenhearted over the fact that the relationship is broken. And I wanna be more brokenhearted over the fact that the relationship is broken than I am angry at them. Help me to see him, help me to see them the way you see them. And here's, here's the thing I can promise you. This is why, this is the prayer God will answer. Is that when we feel toward them, what our heavenly father feels toward them, it becomes easier to move towards them. When I finally feel towards them, what my heavenly father and your heavenly father feels towards them, just think of that person that you're so angry with. If you begin to feel brokenhearted rather than angry, then you know what happens? You think the drawbridge is down, it goes all the way down. You think the welcome mat's out, it's all the way out. You think the door is open, it's all the way open. And nothing changes in the relationship but something extraordinary changes in you. This is why, this is what our heavenly father has invited us into. And as long as my arms are crossed and I forgave them and I'm waiting, God has not finished working in us and on us in this relationship. So would you decide or would you consider deciding? I will get back to, I will not get back at. I'm not gonna repay evil for evil. I'm not going to imagine, and that where it starts? Wouldn't that be interesting? Wouldn't that be nice? You know, we always win those imaginary arguments with people in public and we shame them and people walk off and go, wow, you're right, they're wrong. I'm not even gonna do that anymore. I, I'm gonna take retribution off the table as an option, even if it comes my way. No payback, no back at. No more secretly hoping they fail. No more secretly celebrating their failure. I, Father, I wanna get to the place that if they're mourning, I'm mourning. And if they're rejoicing, I'm rejoicing. And I'm not there yet, but I want you to get me there so I can lean in their direction to the place where I can uncross my arms and move forward. So would you decide or would you consider deciding or would you spend some time thinking about what you would have to do to decide to get back to, not back at. And we will pick it up right there next time in part three of reassembly required. It's just a beginner's guide, a beginner's guide to repairing broken relationships. Before you go, three questions to talk about over lunch over dinner, in the car. You may have to be a little careful who you discuss these or who you have this, this conversation with. Question number one is this, of the four C's that we talked about, convince, convict, coerce, control, which of the four C's did your parents reach for first? Because chances are you may have inherited their approach to conflict management, right? Number two, what's your initial reaction to the notion? What's your emotional reaction to the notion that reconciliation begins with us even when we're not responsible or regardless of who initiated the fuss. What's, what's your kind of you know, reaction to that? And then number three, if you had to fill in the blank and, and the, the most important word here is had to, because maybe nobody comes to mind, but maybe somebody needs to come to mind, but you have so written them off and walked away. If you had to fill in the blank with someone's name, who would you put in that blank? Heavenly Father, help me to see them the way you see them. And would you bring me to the place that I can feel toward them what you feel toward them. The truth is sometimes reconciliation, it depends more on us than we're willing to admit. And if someone has come to mind, perhaps it's time to put that drawbridge all the way down, to open that door all the way up, put the welcome mat all the way out. And as far as it depends on you, and as far as you have control over any of the elements to pave the way for reconciliation, with that person because like your heavenly father did for you, right? It, it, it's what we sing, it's what we sing all the time. It turns out that there really is in fact no shadow that he wouldn't light up, that there was no mountain he wasn't willing to climb up. 
that he was gonna come after you, not to punish you, but to redeem you and to reconcile you. There's no wall, remember that? He won't kick down. There's no lie he won't tear down coming after you, coming after me. So we're Jesus followers. And as Jesus followers, let's do unto others and let's do for others what our heavenly father has done unto and for each one of us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, so much easier to talk about than to do. It's so emotional for some of us, probably for all of us. And Father, for many of us, someone came to mind and we're so irritated because we thought we had put them out of our minds and out of our lives once and for all. And we've forgiven them and it's in the rearview mirror of our lives. But every once in a while, there's that thread of anger, that thread of abandonment, that, that thread of memory that churns in us, and stirs us up. So would you please give each of us wisdom to know what to do with what we just heard and the courage to do it in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We've had a blast here at our Noonan campus. And I know you're watching online. If you haven't been back in person, we would love to see you. Several locations on the south side of Atlanta. You can go to our website, southside.org, to get more information. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you soon.